Good evening folks, um, Paul Anderson here again for a, another fiddle workshop. Um, I suppose you call this a, a virtual fiddle workshop because it's not really quite the same. I kind of see the players, but um, they can hopefully see me. Um, um, we'll see how we get on. This, as usual, could be on a length really. Um, we'll see how we get on. Um, if I go into rambling mode, you um, might find that I'm here for... Um, <laughs> longer than, than otherwise but we're gonna work I'm gonna work on three tunes by James Scott Skinner um, a slow air a strathspe and a reel and I've gone for tunes that are a wee bit less unknown um, by no means unknown certainly in the case of the Brigham Pitar it's fairly well known as a strathspe but um, it's it's not something you you really hear played by um, or nothing other than very traditional Scottish players um, it wouldn't be a tune that's heard very often in some of the contemporary um, traditional music, um, but it's a great tune, um, a wee bit trickier. Um, the Burma Fog, um, that's nae that well kent, really. Um, I, I think I've heard one of them really playing it other than the Bankery of Spain Real Society, and and also Farewell to Drum Blair, the slow air, it's really, really unknown, other than, um, again, the members of the Bankery of Spain Real Society, because I've never found it published in any of the Scott Skinner collections. So three tunes by the, um, the Strathspey King, James Scott Skinner. I'll speak a wee bit about him uh, and the tunes as we go on. But um, I'm going to start with, um, I think we'll start with the real, the Burnow Fog. Um, obviously folk didn't necessarily come from Scotland that are watching this. So when you see a Scottish tune that's got O, the Burn O Fog, with an apostrophe, it's just a, a typically Scottish way, this or stuff Scottish way to say of um, the burn of Forg, and Forg is a place. It's up in Strathbogie. It's um, let's say maybe five miles roughly from the town of Huntley, big market town in Aberdeenshire. A lot of folklore and tradition around about that area. And um, James Scott Skinner had a cottage on the Drumblair estate, the Gardner's cottage, I think it was at Drumblair House. Um, a William McCarthy was the landowner there. He's a man who made his money in the iron industry. And um, the Burn of Fog was really close to there. Anybody who's um, a, a fan of Scotch whisky, single malt Scotch whisky, will possibly have heard of uh, Glendronach. Glendronach Whisky Distillery is very close by there as well. So the Burn of Fog would have been a familiar um, um, landmark to the Skinner while he was up there, and that is the burn that feeds the Glendronach whiskey distillery. So let's say it's very, very recognisably James Scott Skinner, I have to say. I think anybody who knows much about his playing or um it's Scottish fiddle music, they would they would probably recognise the style. But we'll have a go at it anyway. I'm gonna play it through just a, a steady speed, nice slow. I'll go through it. Um, just to let you hear the melody, um, I've posted the music earlier, so if you want to have a go at playing through with me, that would be grand. Um, but I'll go back and go it through um, a few times slowly after that. Okay, so The Burn of Fog by James Scott Skinner. <laughs> It's a great reel, actually. It's um, possibly because it's harder to find that it's not so commonly played. Um, some of these other reels are far better kent, but I think that's as good as any. But um, it's not found in that many collections. Um, the only book I think that I can find it in 
is um, Skinner's Logie Collection. I'll, I'll flash a book up to let you see it, but it's quite f hard to find. Um, it's really an antiquarian book now, although I think it was Everdeen City Council released a limited edition run of reprints um, to the same quality. It's a, it's a beautiful book. We kind of gold um, up the seam, seems the pages hardback. Um, gold, gold writing on the front, um, so it's it's difficult to come by these things, they're quite collectible. So I think that's why it's maybe nice such a well kent tune, but um, I think we'll go back and we'll play it through a few times now for folk to try and play along to it if they like. Um, if you're tuning in to watch a concert, um, this might not be the moment. <laughs> we do our concert on a Friday night. Um, eight o'clock UK time, but this is this is really just to run through some tunes and hopefully give some insight into the music. So we'll take this slowly now. I'm going to maybe take it a bit slower than I've been in previous weeks because Shona said that I I should maybe play it a bit slower because my slow is maybe not quite slow enough sometimes. So we'll play it very very slow. So after three, one, two, three. <laughs> slow enough or would yeah. you sure thinks it was slow enough so that's all right um a few things just to, to mention really if you are a player and you're watching and um the the bowen can vary quite a lot i mean there's most of these bars there's eight semi quavers but there's a variety of ways i've bowed this and this gives a, de a different accent depending how you bow it but on the whole, you tend to want to um, have the first beat of the bar played on a down bow. So that's part of how you, you're trying to do it. Sometimes adding slurs give a wee bit of fluency to the tune because just bowing up and down, up and down can be a little repetitive and a bit like sawing sticks. But um, the, a few slurs allow the, the, the tune to flow a little bit. Um, when you're playing it slow, try and use as much bow as possible because it, it all feeds into sort of mastering the use of the bow and again bigger bows more volume I think there was a dance bar in the world that doesn't like a, a good strong player and uh, using your bow effectively gives you the, the volume and power so we'll play it again um, so, some of you might notice if you've got the, the, the music I've written down I've marked in a, a few four fingers and these are to save the bow and being maybe quite so busy that you can keep um, a passage on one string rather than going from the A string up to the E and back because there's a few bits for you would go up to the E string for one note and come back down again but if you play the fourth finger it allows you to keep it all on the one string so it just it keeps it a bit tidier and um, it's just it's a wee shortcut as regards um, making things easier for the player and because the easier it's, it should I sound if you're playing for a concert it should sound as effortless as possible um, regardless of how difficult a bit of music is and this goes for any type of music whether it's rock music or classical it should never sound like you're just hanging on by the skin of your teeth it should sound as effortless as possible so um, one of them like the, how you bow it that can mark that sound a wee bit um, easier to handle is, is not a bad thing. So, go back to the beginning here. Um, yeah, I've got the music here just so I'm uh, getting the right references on the music. Can and they, just tell me something What's that? Showing us want to say something. Sorry, there's a guy here, Dave Smith, who's just said Scott Skinner was my maternal grandfather's cousin. Ah, well, that's a very personal um, reference there. That's yeah. a, a, a relation of James Scott Skinner has 
um, sent a message. Did you say it? Peter? Dave Smith. Peter Dave Smith. No. Dave oh, Dave Smith. Smith. Sorry, Dave Smith. Uh, and he's he's a relative of James Scott Skinner. So, hello. Um, you've got more in common with him than I have. <laughs> I play his music, but you're you're a relative. So, nice. it's nice to see you looking in. So, um, it'll all be good stuff said about Skinner. So, there you go. Right, back to the beginning with the burn of fog. about the fiddle quite a lot there's crossing strings but it's using for the the G string up to the E string so it's using a lot of fiddles uh, 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 the whole scope of the fiddle it doesn't go into third position but it's tricky enough without that so it's it's not the easiest tune but it's, a, it's got a lovely melody um, the other things to work for uh, watch out for would be the barrels um, the fourth bar in fact the last bar at each measure that's for the barrel. It's very common in Scottish reels. Um, always play with a down up down. You slow it down, it's just this. And that is pretty easy, I suppose. But a bit quicker. Always down up down. And the last note's the same length as the first two put together. So, um, you want that to come across, so it's da 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 rather than da 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 da. It's da 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 da. Um, if you're just tuned in and that's the first thing you've heard, you might be wondering what the hell I'm speaking about. But it's it's barrels which are very important in Scottish reels. So. <laughs> need to be really percussive. So that percussiveness um, really needs to be fired out, articulate clean, articulate, crisp play, and that's what you're looking for. So, I'm going to play it through um, once again, twice through, first time fairly slow, and then some approaching dance speed. Um, and bearing in mind, if you, you're playing for Scottish country dancing, like the Royal Scottish Country Dance Association, um, or it, society it could be, um, you're probably going to play it a, a good bit steadier than you would for a Cayley dance or even as a soloist. Um, so it, it, the, the tempo can vary. It depends what you're playing it for. But it should have lift. It should um, feel like something you want to dance to. So, um, yeah, that can vary quite a bit. But we'll, um, we'll try and get a little bit closer to dance speed. But we'll take it slow and steady for a start. <laughs> Thank you. 
fucking real. Um, if there's anybody that starts playing that in their repertoire that didn't kind of afford, this workshop has been totally worthwhile because I think it's a great tune. So there we go, the Burner Ford. Now this is the book I was speaking about. Um, difficult to get your hands on now. Um, probably inverted as usual. Um, I can't do anything about that on Facebook Live with a Huawei phone. Um, it's just the way it is, but you'll have to be dealing with that. So it actually says the Logie Collection, unless you can read back backwise, by James Scott Skinner. There's quite a few songs in there. The melodies are frequently very good. The lyrics are frequently, um, let's just say, leave a lot to be desired. They haven't stood the test, the test of time. They're very sentimental Victorian type of things. Um, for instance, if you've got lyrics here for the Burma Fork, <laughs> which is a real, it's near the best ideal. I mean, it's a great long thing. So, that's where I'm showing you that, because you kind of read it anyway. But it's a beautiful book. Um, so it's a nice thing to hear. This is the, the reprint that was done in the 1990s. I forget the year, but I, I actually played at the um, the launch of the book, which took place in Provost Skeen's House in Everdeen. Um, the original was blue, but... The, the modern reproduction is very faithful to the style, the font, the type of paper, the fact that Skinner's, well, here's a picture of Skinner, and here, look, a, a youthful Skinner. Okay, can you all see that? That's a younger version. Now this, he's still quite stern looking, but um, maybe not quite as ferocious looking as some of his older photos, and kind of got crepe paper on it to keep it in good condition, but you can you get an idea of the style. A, an expensive book at the time, expensive book to produce now. So anyway, so this is a couple of tunes are out of this Logie collection. If you can get a copy, um, get a copy. It'd probably be quite expensive. It's the first antiquarian book that I got. and um, We were in a shop in Aberdeen with my parents and my dad spotted it and we bought it. And it's the first um, genuinely old book of fiddle music that I, that I ever had. I mean, it was for the family, because my brother David and my sister Heather, as well as myself, I played the fiddle, so it was really bought for the family, but great thing to hear. Um, I've got quite a few collections, so I've got this modern one and I've got a, a, a copy of the, um, a couple of copies of the original as well, because it's one of these things, I, I love them, I just look after them, so um, let's go on to the next tune. Now this is a Strathspey called the Brig of Pitar. again it's got the O instead of the OV, which is typical. Um, Scots dialect. Um, so I'll play it through, um, tell you a wee bit about the tune, and then we'll work through it several times. Okay. So this is in G, it's a great tune, um, but again, nay the easiest, but nay the hardest bits. There's e easier Skinner tunes to play, but I think it's got a really distinctive um, melody. Okay. Okay. Battery issue on the phone there. So there's a few tricky things to watch out for in that. Um, fourth fingers used, you've got sharps appearing, uh, naturals, um, so the, 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 the placement of the finger can vary within one bar, so one finger can be moving about, so it's it's a little bit tricky but it is a good tune, it's bit very distinctive and quite, I think quite modern sounding for the period it was written in. Um, the Brig of Ptah, or the bridge, again, Brig is how you would say bridge in Scotland, traditionally. So the Brig of Ptah is um, the bridge at Ptah. Now, Ptah is, is an area, um, it's a tr tributary of the, the River Dee. Um, there's a hotel at Ptah, and um, that was once owned by Donald Dinney, who's arguably the most famous... Highland Games competitor there's ever been. Um, he used to practice tossing the caber and uh, 
uh, shot putt and hammer and all that stuff beside the hotel and that green is still there you can see for it isn't it the famous Denny stones are there so this this would have been a place and a and Denny would have been a man that was familiar to James Scott Skinner um, hugely successful figure and um, this is a suitably good quality tune so we'll play um, from the beginning slow and steady like we did with the reel um, careful with the, the tuning um, try and follow the bone if you've got the music there um, we'll go through a few pointers in a bit but let's just play it slow as usual pull out the long notes keep the short notes very very short if you're playing snap bone as often as possible down up that's the preferred way to do it because you get more attack and that's a, a great thing for the accent in the music again but a wee bit slower tricky bits and pieces in that to watch out for. The tuning would be one thing. Um, like the burn of Fog, it's using the entire scope of the fiddle. It uses every string. Um, playing snap bows on, on, on the change of strings can be tricky because you haven't got a lot of time on one string before you have to go into the next. So you have to be careful that you catch the short notes cleanly enough that you hear them before you're very quickly on the next and for the cross strings it makes it even harder um, as an example so there's two in a row here so you, you've got one snap crossing a string then you drop right down to the G you jump a string play a note and then back up so that's really tricky that's in the very first bar So that takes a wee bit of art to strain the bone. Um, it's a lot trickier than uh, maybe I gave enough thought to really. <laughs> that, that's not easy to play and it will take practice, but it's easy to get very dis disheartened by something like that. I think it is so difficult, but tap time. And if nothing else, it should stretch you as a player, but it's a, I mean, I love it as a tune. Tricky to get for that A down to the G and then back to the D string. Okay, so we'll try it again, I think, just go through it. Um, like any of these tunes, there's, there's various options you can use for bowing. Because I bow them a certain way, doesn't mean that's the only way to bow it. And indeed, I frequently change the bow when it's on the, the published copies. So never take the bowing as a definitive thing. But there's certain things like the first beat in the bar. You almost always try to play it with a down bow if you can. It's a wee bit stronger, maybe it just gives a little bit more of an accent in the bar. Um, snap bows, I tend to want to, if I can, always down up to get that snappiness and tend to be the 
top part of the bow for that. Um, so there's a few things just to watch out for, but you could vary this, like the last tune. Eight semi-quavers, there's umpteen ways you could do that, they could all be separate. You could slaughter first two, miss the next two, then the next two, there's various ways you can do it. So let's go back, play it slow and then we'll pick up a tempo and then move, maybe move on to the sl slow air, farewell to drum blare. I'm just going to stop there. That um, is a good example of kind of managing how you use your bow. You need the whole bow for that to play that nicely. You've got four notes to play in one bow if you bow it that way. You use half the bow. Um, by using less bow, you get very noticeably less volume. So I want to get my bow to the heel so I can play that four downs on one bow without losing any of the volume. bars of the tune so it's the third bar in the second line if you've got the music um, the triplets are very definitely notated to be different if you normally hear and see in triplets um, so it's usually no notated like this but it's definitely this that's notated And then it's different in the next bar. So I would suggest that's what the composer is looking for. I certainly try to emphasize that. Um, so you could you could go. So they're, so they're noticeably different. Um, okay, so let's go back, play it twice through, and then we'll leave it and move on. Sure, sure. Sorry, Shona, you were going to say I've something. Got, I've got a question here from Hugh Murray Elliott. Oh, Hugh. Who okay. is a learner. Okay, Hugh. He would, uh, would you care to advise on the make of strings you are using and what about your bow? Does it have anything special about it? It was made by elves in Gondor. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a lot of nonsense. It's, it's actually a French bow as far as I can tell. Um, when I bought the bow, um, I looked at about four or five bows I got a, got a shot of to try out and this was far from being the most expensive one but it just felt really good in my hand the weight the balance the flexibility it was just it just felt right for me for somebody else they might find it oh I like a heavier bow or I like a lighter bow um, so for me it, it, it just felt right as it turned out it was worth a lot more than what I paid for it um, I was kind of lucky in that but it's a nice bit of wood. It's a Pernambuco French made bow of an age I can't tell you. Um, I've had a few folk look at it and they generally say, oh, it's a really nice bow, but they can't say who made it or where it came from. There's no mark to say that, but they could tell very quickly oh, it's a nice bow. So it's actually um, silver and ivory mounted. So the knickknacks, the tuning button at the end, um, up at the frog, mother of pearl. Very common to see that. It's a bit silver there, silver wire at the grip, and ivory up at the tip. So it's, it's a nice bow. Um, Does that make a difference? No. To, no. It marks no difference to the quality of the bow. It's just a nice way to finish the bow. The important thing about a bow is the stick. The quality of the stick and the quality of the, the craftsman to, to, to find that bow within 
a wooden plug, essentially. But um, Pernambuco is, I think, still regarded as the best bows um, are made out of that. So, that, so that there's the first thing about the bow. So very important. A lot of folk overlook the importance for a player. It's, I think it's all about the fiddle, but I think any decent player will acknowledge how important the bow is in the whole overall scheme of things. So um, it's worth getting that right, and actually yeah, it's worth spending a bit more money to get a, a decent one that'll work well for you. Um, that said, the carbon fibre bows that you can get, um, frequently made in China, they're actually really good for the money you spend. If you've got a wooden bow for £150 and a carbon fibre bow for the same money, I would I would buy the carbon fibre fiber bow to, to get a wooden bow that's that kind of quality, uh, yeah, you have to spend an awful lot. But they're, they're never as good as a, a really good traditional wooden bow. Um, Pernambuco is for that you have got it for here. So anyway, that was the first question. The second question was? The strings. Strings. Um, matter of taste, depends on fit you like. Sound wise, um, I use Parastro Olive strings, which there's no doubt they're quite expensive. They didn't wear quite as well as, as some strings. They, kinda, they can wear out a bit quicker. Um, but I've found over the years, and I have tried lots of different strings, that I keep going back to them. I kind of get the sound I'm looking for on any other string. Um, I think as a player, you, you have a sound in your head that you expect to sound like, and um, it, it's very noticeable from the fiddles here in your ear. When folk are standing back, I don't think they get the same feeling. You, they, an audience has a very different um, perception of what you sound like than you have yourself. Um, it's interesting to hear it's all played back actually, and um, I, it's something I noticed when I was competing that I I had a great sense that I had lots of expression, louds and softs and slow airs, and I'd be dealt when I come off by my accompanist Margaret Smith. She'd say, "Oh, you need you didn't have enough louds and softs, not enough expression." I said, "There was that's nonsense." But then if I heard a recording, I would of course you're absolutely right. So your own perception of your playing can be a little bit um, off. But I use Parastro Olive because I, I like the tone. They're, they're bright and rich and warm. Um, they're, they're quite soft. I think some folk maybe wouldn't like that. You have to... Um, they have to suit your type of playing. Um, some folk like steel strings, but I like them. They're, uh, t I think it's still aluminium wound gut. It's what they're made of. So they're quite soft and flexible. They take a wee, a wee while to settle. Um, when it comes to um, biding in tune, it can take a, take a couple of days before they settle and bide in tune. You find you're constantly fighting them. Um, the E string, it, I think it well, it's coated in gold. I reckon if it makes it sound better, but it certainly works for me. So I like it. Loads of tone. Um, Anyway, but you could see that's quite a dramatic bit of music that, that that works on this fiddle for me as a player. Other players would find other types of strings that they'll like. As a as a beginner, I think it was a Yarger strings, which is a steel string, and I, I, I think I found that they're a bit too a bit. Um, I wouldn't say they were harsh, but they were harder sounding. I think I like the the warmth of these tones, the toned strings that kind of suit me as a player. But um, it's really up to the player to find what they look for because different strings will sound different on different fiddles. And also, the rosin, did I skimp on buying decent rosin because the rosin will improve your tone. If you've got cheap, um, I would call white rosin, um, it, it, it will give you a hard, abrasive tone. Um, then I put on too much. I mean, you shouldn't be standing in a cloud of fog when you're playing because there's so much rosin coming, out, coming off your fiddle. That will give you an abrasive sound. The bow will certainly stick to the strings <laughs> and you'll get a tone, but um, you don't need anything like that. I, I maybe put on every day a little bit. And if I'm playing more, I, I might put more on later on, but you don't need to see bucket loads of rosin coming off of it for a little. It might you sound harsh, but certainly get good um, rosin. And I use rosin-wise, it's parastro olive. So, I mean, if that's the only thing you take a waffle of this, we virtual workshop that um, the importance of your bow and your rosin um, it wouldn't be a waste of time the strings, the rosin the bow, the eye tie into getting a successful 
end product and how you sound. Bottom line, line is how it sounds. Um, you can hear really, if it would be considered from a classical point of view, a not very good technique. Um, things like kind of fiddle sitting into the palm of your hand and um, the fiddle drop down. I've seen some really, that I would consider, not very good grips. I've seen there's a few guys I've seen playing like, with a bow like this and I'd say, oh, that's, that's enough a grip there. But actually, if you're not looking at it, does it matter if it sounds good? So a, a, a naturally gifted player will, will find a way of working around that. There's lots of examples and lots of different music. So a good player, um, I mean, I would say, I mean, Ali Bain is, is probably the best Kent Scottish fiddler, but he does play with his, 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 his fiddle into his palm. John McCusker. Um, John McCusker, who I just mentioned. Um, Stefan Grappelli was the same, and... For, for folk who exceptional ability, I think that, that they find a way to make it work. Um, so its name may be crucially important, but it, it, it's a, for mess folk, a, a decent technique will um, help mess players get the best out of it. But it, it's not the be all and end all, certainly, because I think good players will come through ultimately. So let's move on to farewell to Drum Blair. Hope that answered Hugh's question. Hugh, I okay, it was half a rambling answer there, but um, hopefully you got got the gist of it. Um, so the last tune I'm going to play, I think the only place it's published is in this, which again I'll be back to front. It's the Elphinstone Collection of Fiddle Tunes to the Northeast. Um, is it Tiny Tude? Is that how you pronounce it? Um, Christine Martin's yeah, Isla Sky. You'll you'll get a copy. And it, it was it was our tunes were previously unpublished. And that tune is in there, and I have to wonder why it's never been published. But the only place I'd seen it was in the collection of the Bancrista Spay and Real Society. It was their, um, one of their sets included this tune. And um, I've never seen it on a Skinner collections, but it's been published in the Elphinstone collection now. So I'll play it through for you. Um, obviously, because it's nice and slow, if you've got the music for earlier, you can join in and play along with me. But um, I think it's a beautiful tune. And um, Drum Blair links in with the burner for Drum Blair is just right there. And um, this, Skinner got a, a, a cottage rent free for the Laird there, who was a, a great admirer. And Skinner, who was frequently struggling with money, he was bankrupt more than once. Um, rent-free cottage would have been an incredible um, boost. So when he left there, because he lived in lots of places, he lived near Kerenur, Aberlour up for the Walker Shortbread, uh, Bankery, Aberdeen, he lived in lots of places. Um, so this was him moving on at this point and just a wee tribute to somewhere that he was fond of, obviously. So farewell to Drum Blair by James Scott Skinner.
Drum Blair, which um, I, I think is a beautiful tune. So again, it's not played commonly because it's just not really commonly available. It's not on any collections that Skinner published. And so the only place that I found that was in the Bankers to Spain Reels um, sets. Um, Shona, did you um, have something to say? Murray McLeod's asking, what about the fiddlers who grip the bow halfway up the stick? What about, uh, so Murray McLeod, yeah. did you say Murray? Um, what about the players who grip the bow halfway up the stick? Well, um, it works perfectly well for them, to be honest. I'm not going to say nay to do it. Although if I was teaching a pupil, I would encourage him against it. Purely because you're, kind of, if you're putting like that, you're halfing the amount of bow, realistically. And then some folk that grip halfway up, they don't even use uh, the bow that's there. <laughs> that's there. So what you're doing is... is reducing the amount of potential tone you've got and as a player I think you want to have as much potential as possible um, it's one thing to play quietly because you want to it's another because that you can only play quietly and rely on um, turning the volume up in the PA system you can, that'll do it for you but you should really look to, to be able to create that yourself so it's, it's, it's definitely harder to control initially to hide it back there. It's a great long bit of stick to, to have to be able to master. And I suppose on a fiddle style, whether it be classical, jazz, Irish, Scottish, bluegrass, Scandinavian, um, for a fiddler, you rely on the bow to get the sound. Um, Scottish fiddle music's no different. Um, how you handle the bow will have a direct effect on how you sound. Because if your bow is bad, the sound you get is never going to be, it's never going to be great. And there's things like bowing round the corner um, doesn't help with tone. Um, you want as nice a tone as you can. Certainly, I always strived to work on my bowing so you get a good tone. And using the hail bow, certainly let the bow glide. That's we nay work at all. That's just letting the bow do the work. So that extra bow that I've got, because I use the whole bow, gives me a lot more scope in playing slow airs especially, because they rely on telling a story, painting a picture, so expression, louds and softs, and um, difference in tempo. When you get more dramatic, the tempo pushes, when you're pulling it back at the, the, the end of a phrase or a measure, it, it generally is going to slow down and get a wee bit quieter um, at the same time. So these things go in tandem. And so the use of your bow, that's the main thing you've got for that. Although um, extra vibrato plus speed of the bow will definitely give you definitely give you lots of volume and power. Again, if I go back to that A on the E string. So if I play there, unaccustomed as I am. The only way I can mark it louder is pressing. And you begin to hear that. It's scratchy, I suppose we'd say, a wee bit distorted. But, but rhythmically, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to control it up there, I would say, initially. But there's nothing you should not, shouldn't be able to do by holding it at the end of the bow, but you've got much more tonal um, potential. And certainly, only the players I admire, whether they be players of the past, like Hector McAndrew, or my teacher Dougie Lawrence, um, some of the players that I play in the day that I, that I really respect they, they are use the full length of the bow um, if you, I think one of the, the kind of notable Shetland players, folk like Ke Kevin Henderson Thank or Brian, Brian Gare um, they are use loads of bow and they have got, that's why they've got expressive styles of playing so the use of the bow is important um, I'm not telling folk need to play there but it, it does restrict that you can do. So anyway, I hope that's crystal clear. <laughs> so back to the uh, farewell to drum blare. Um, it's nice and slow, so I think let's just play through it. Um, like on a slow air, expression is something you, it's very much down to individual, but definitely something that you should tr strive to instill in your play. And it's one thing just playing it in one level like this. Even the open strings, it get, it's a thinner sound than a fourth. The warmer tone with a fourth finger.
um, I, I would often go up to third position. Uh, in Scottish traditional fiddling, it really sliding onto notes or off a notes is near something you really find. But sometimes when you go up third position, if it's subtly done, it works really well. Um, slides are much more of an Irish style, style thing. You wouldn't traditionally find that sort of really obvious slides. But I, I would hit sparingly here and there. It works. It's almost like a sigh. You can. It's that. It's kind of delicate. So like this. Nail it, guys. So much. So I, I wouldn't lean, lean into the, sl the, the the slides quite that much. But a wee bit of there, delicately done, is is very effective. Um, so four fingers, take the, 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 the harshness off an open string, warms it up a wee bit. Third position can keep a passage on one string, so the tonal colour is, is consistent. Okay, so we'll go for the start. Three, four. Stop there before we move on. Um, ho hopefully you'll you notice a, how, how big a difference between the slow bits and the quick bits. You have to be careful playing slow airs that you didn't play them too slow because they they really drag. Folks struggle to like I maintain interest <laughs> if it's like Carl Treacle moving. Um, it needs to move, but you can really push it, but pull it back. There's bits that are really slow, like at the end of that phrase. second half, it's usually more dramatic. And it contrasts. Moves a bit and back. Farewell to Drum Blair, the Brigga Pitar, and the Burma Fog. Three tunes by James Scott Skinner. Lesser well kent, Brigga Pitar's fairly well kent, but I think good examples of his composing, and um, I hope you've enjoyed them. Um, I'll be back next week with something. Um, somebody did ask last week about doing a workshop on reels, because I've done on Strasbourg, slow air, slow Strasbourg. We also did. Uh, a workshop on my own compositions and last week on Neil Gow's composition, so hence this week Scott Skinner. But somebody did ask about reels, so we'll look, have a look at some reels next week and um, just a wee bit about coming to grips with making them danceable. Um, in fact, I get the left bone, um, but just maybe run through three, four tunes again, like tonight. So I um, hope you've enjoyed it, if, hope you found it interesting if you've been watching. Um, absolutely free as usual but if folk do want to um, chip in um, as usual it's www.paypal.me forward slash 
Paul Anderson shown at dawn, and it's shown at dawn because Donaldson doesn't fit in the space given. So anyway, we'll be back on um, Friday night. We're going to hear another concert. I think Sean is up for for um, singing again. So again, it'll be much more varied than sitting watching me on my Todd. And again, I, very few tunes have been doubled up over the past few weeks. That's seven of these I think I've done now. So Friday will be the, the, the eighth um, concert we've done live in the lounge. And I'll endeavour to make sure I've done a double tunes up. I think we've had, I've had two in seven concerts. So um, we'll see if we can keep that going. I'll be ending up, we'll be going back to the beginning again shortly. Um, but anyway, thanks very much. Take care, folks. And um, by the time, do not drink Domestus. <laughs> it's not going to cure you, it'll kill you. So um, take care. Um, I'll be back in the garden in the morning. And put my ties in. Okay, all the best. Over and out. <laughs>